Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. I physically am on the trail, out of town doing magazine business. One of the stories that I'm pursuing right now involves John Brown's 1859 raid. During the course of my research, I found several versions of the story about a sword that belonged originally to George Washington. And thanks to a descendant in the Washington family who was taken hostage by a detachment of men from John Brown, the sword that was taken from this hostage slash descendant of Washington became interesting to John Brown who decided to carry it. It had a belt along with it. He strapped on the sword belt, carried the sword all the way through the end of the incident, the insurrection that ended when Marines ordered by Colonel Robert E. Lee bashed down the door. There were pistol revolver shots, musket shots. There were sabers being thrust to the air and apparently a saber I'm assuming swung by one of the Marines, glanced off the sword belt buckle of John Brown, perhaps saving him from a fatal wound. Anyway, it almost sounds fantastical. So I wanted to check into it and I spent a good bit of time going down the research rabbit hole to try and find out. In the end, I found two reliable sources that I wanna share in this episode and give you a sense of where I think we're getting a little closer to the reality of the story. The first reliable source is Dr. Eric Goldstein. He's the author of a book called The Swords of George Washington. The other individual is that descendant who was taken hostage by a detachment of John Brown's men. His name is Lewis William Washington. He was the great grand nephew of George Washington and his life dates are 1812 to 1871. So let me start with Dr. Eric Goldstein. He talks about the sword and he describes it as a steel hilted small sword. It was initially thought to date a little bit later in Washington's lifetime, but in recent discoveries, there's now a belief that Washington actually came into possession of it during the revolution. There's no relation of this sword to Frederick the Great. That's been debunked, which was oftentimes talked about even during the 1859 raid, the newspaper coverage refers to it as Frederick the Great, a sword given by Frederick the Great. So what we have is a sword that Washington came into possession of, a beautiful decorative sword. Not sure how he came into possession of it, but it likely happened during the revolution. Washington loved the sword. He had it customized and wore it sort of as a dress slash ceremonial sword. So that's a little bit of backstory. So the sword actually does exist. Now I wanna to move to Lewis, William Washington, the grand, pardon me, great grand nephew of George Washington. Will William, Lewis William Washington lived on an estate called Beale Air, which was located about five miles outside Harper's Ferry. And in fact, he was taken hostage by a man named Cook and uh, a detachment of five men that Cook was in command of. This happened on the night of October 16th, 1859, the first night of Brown's insurrection. Washington was taken hostage. And while this was happening, Cook also recalled these relics that were handed down through the Washington family. Cook knew about these relics because he had visited Washington's house about a month before the raid happened, he was really sort of scoping out, casing the Washington joint and getting a sense of Washington can be valuable as a hostage. Also, Washington owned enslaved people. They might be of value. So Cook knew about this, sent this detachment gets sent. We know all about this because in early 1860, after the raid, 
after Brown was convicted and hung, there was a, an official congressional, I believe it was actually a Senate inquiry, and uh, William Lewis William Washington was interviewed, and his testimony is for the record. So I want to read you a little bit of his testimony, which talks about Cook, the visit before the John Brown raid. It talks, goes on to talk about uh, the identification of the relics, and then it talks about, he talks about John Brown. So this is a good bit of information. So here we go. I've, I've just pulled a couple questions here. So question, we're going to start. Question, will you please state your age and where you reside? This is Lewis Washington. Answer, I'm about 46 years of age. I reside in Jefferson County, Virginia. I am a farmer. Question, are you a landholder and slave owner? Answer, yes, sir. Question, how far is your residence from Harper's Ferry? Answer, it is about five miles. Question, will you state whether you saw an armed party at your house, who they were, what their business was, and what brought them there on the night of Sunday, the 16th of October last? Answer, there was a body at my house, five of whom I saw, and the other I did not see. They appeared at my chamber door about half past one o'clock in the morning. My name was called in an undertone and supposing it to be by some friend who had possibly arrived late and being familiar with the house had been admitted in the rear by the servants. I opened the door in my nightshirt and slippers. I was in bed and asleep. As I opened the door, there were four armed men with their guns drawn upon me just around me three had rifles and one a large revolver. The man having a revolver held in his left hand a large flambeau, which was burning. That's a torch. The person in command turned out to be a man named Stevens. He asked me my name and then referred me to a man of the name of Cook. That's our friend Cook, who had been at my house before to know whether I was Colonel Washington. On being told that I was, he said, you are our prisoner. I looked around, and the only thing that astonished me particularly was the presence of this man, Cook, who had been at my house some three or four weeks before that. I met him in the street at Harper's Ferry as I was passing along. He came out and addressed me by name and said, quote, I believe you have a great many interesting relics at your house. Could I have permission to see them if I should walk out someday, end quote. I said yes. At that time, I supposed he was an armorer engaged in the public works at Harper's Ferry, almost all of whom know me, though I do not know them, but I am familiar with the faces of most of them. I had not seen this man before, or I should have recognized him. He came out to my house about four weeks before the attack. While there, he was looking at a pistol that General Lafayette had presented to General Washington about the period of the revolution. Now, this is a reference to a pair of pistols that Lafayette had given to Washington. And apparently that's genuine, it's true. Let me continue. While there, he was looking at a pistol that General Lafayette had presented to General Washington about the period of the revolution. He asked me if I had ever shot it. I told him I had. He asked, does it shoot well? I told him I had not shot it for six or eight or 10 years, that I had merely tried it and cleaned it and put it in the cabinet. And I remarked it would never be shot again. He was very curious about arms. He finally told me that he belonged to a Kansas hunting party and found it very profitable to hunt buffaloes for their hides. He unbuttoned his coat and showed me two revolvers and said he was in the habit of carrying them in his occupation, that he had been attacked with chills and fevers some time ago and was wearing them to accustom his hips to their weight. He asked if I was fond of shooting. I said I formerly was. And then he said, you would possibly like to try these? We went in front of my house and under a tree, we stuck up a target and fired some 24 shots. He then told me that he had a rifle, a 22 shooter, and he would like me to look at it as he saw I had some fondness for firearms. He said to me, when you come down to the ferry, if you will call, I should like to see it and try it. 
I was at the ferry, it so happened, 10 or 15 days from that period, and I inquired for him. I happened to know his name in this way. He did not introduce himself when he came, but in taking up his large revolver, the size used in the army, I found John E. Cook engraved on the breech of it on a brass plate. And he said, I engraved that myself. I borrowed the tools from a silversmith, a bungler, and thinking I could do it better myself, I did. Then I said, I presume that is your name? And he said, yes. When I asked for him at the ferry, they told me he had left. And I supposed in all probability, he had gone to Kansas, as he had told me he intended to go in a few days. Believing that he had gone to Kansas, I was surprised to find him among the number at my house. So next question. You say that he had asked before asking permission to go to your house and see certain relics and that he did go there. Did you show him those arms? Answer, yes, he saw and handled them. What did they consist of? That's the next question. Answer, the sword presented by Frederick the Great to General Washington, which he used as a dress sword, and one of the pistols presented to him by Lafayette. Question, how did they come into your possession? Answer, they descended to my father and from him to me. My grandfather had the first choice of five swords left by the general. So here we have it. We have proof that Lewis Washington had swords, had, pardon me, a sword that was handed down from a group of swords that his father had the choice of the pick as the inheritance was being handed down to the family. We know that Cook, this man from Kansas, who described himself as being part of a hunting party, was aware of these relics, and he visited Washington's residence, inspected them. So we also know, thanks to uh, the good doctor that we spoke of, that I spoke of earlier, Dr. Goldstein, that the sword was definitely Washington's and had provenance and had been something that Washington, an item that Washington really appreciated. So now I want to get to the end of the story because we have a note in Brown's, pardon me, in Washington's testimony that after Brown's raid, the sword turns up again. So here's the questioner in the, 18, the early 1860 um, interview with Washington. This question says, I understood you to say that they carried off a pistol and a sword belonging to your family relics. Did you recover them? So here we have the questioner asking, what happened to the sword? What happened to the pistol? And Washington's reply tells us the little detail about how Brown came to be connected to Washington's sword. So here's Washington's answer. I recovered the sword. Brown carried that in his hand all day Monday. That's the day that Lee and his troops come in. And when the attacking party came on, that is, they began to batter down the door. He, Brown, laid it on a fire engine. Remember, they're in the Arsenal's fire engine house. He, Brown, laid it on a fire engine, and after the rescue, I got it. So I think this is proof, at least from Washington's words, and Washington was there. He's a, he's a witness and an unwilling participant. As Lee's men were battering down the door, Brown takes the sword, and there's no evidence of a belt buckle. He takes the sword and lays it on top of the fire engine. So I think that sort of suggests that there was no thrust by a saber that hit a belt uh, buckle that Brown was wearing and saved his life. It's pretty clear from Washington's testimony that Brown took the sword he was holding in his hand took that sword of Washington's and laid it on top of a fire engine in the engine house. So one last detail that I want to share with you. You're may, you may be wondering what happened to the sword. Well, in 1871, after Washington's death, the sword, the remaining pistol 
from the presentation of pistol from Lafayette and other items are sold to the New York State Library. Again, this is 1871. 40 years later in 1911, a fire destroys a big chunk of the library. One of the items that is in the fire is Washington sword. While the cleanup is happening, a worker sees a twisted up piece of metal, sort of notes it mentally, but doesn't do anything about it. Not long after that, there are some other workers on site and they're talking about the sword of Washington's that was lost. Well, this guy connects the dots and he realized that twisted piece of wreckage I saw is actually the sword. So he goes back, he retrieves this hunk of metal and brings it back and says, here's the sword. Eventually that sword is somewhat repaired. The blade is straightened out. There's still some damage that the fire causes, fire tarnish and things like that. Um, parts of it, the grip is, is basically gone, but most of the sword is intact. So it does survive in some way, and it's still available at the New York State Library. So there you have it, the story of John Brown, the story of Lewis William Washington, the story of George Washington's sword, and how, at least according to my research, it appears that Brown did carry that sword for a time during the raid. So until the next episode, we'll see you.